Okay, this is part two of my reading of my novel, Kamari and the Lucky Cat. This is also available on ebook with a different cover that I'm very proud of all my different covers. These are a lot of fun. Um, this time we're going to pick up a few chapters after where I left off on part one with chapter six, The Interrogation. Chen has uh, disappeared after their time together at her apartment, and uh, Kamori has another ordeal to go through after her little interview with him. After work the next day, Kamori waited at her desk until all of her co-workers had left the floor because her supervisor had asked her to stay after hours and have a chat. She had her coat on and her bag packed up just in case it wouldn't be a long talk, but as the minutes ticked by, no one appeared. Waiting a full thirty minutes before getting up to see if anyone was still in the office, Kamori only noticed two guards standing by the elevators. Walking around the perimeter of her cubicle toward her supervisor's desk, she saw no one was around. The chair at her supervisor's desk was empty. Kamori's heart sank. The elevators were blocked by the security guards, but she had no choice to confront them unless she wanted to spend the night at the office. As she neared the elevator, the two men looked at her with interest. Kamori Ando, the one closest to her asked, looking at her knowingly. Yes? You'll have to come with us. What? Why? I was supposed to meet with my supervisor. I've... He, he never said anything about meeting with security. Each man took her by one arm and gently pulled her down the hall toward a freight elevator that led to a walkway between their office building and the security offices next door. We asked him to detain you. We need to ask you a few questions, that's all. Kamori's mind was racing as they got in the elevator and punched the button. Why would she be in trouble? Is this what happened to Belinda not that many days ago? She wondered if she would ever return to her office or her home. Most people who disappeared were never seen again. When the doors opened, they led her down a long hallway and a few, a few sets of stairs to a nice office suite and gestured for her to enter a large room that was bare except for a table and chairs. She sat down, clutching her bag closer to her and feeling her stomach flip. One of the men returned to sit across from her with a foul as she heard the door shut behind her. It has come to the attention of the secret police that you have had contact with the drifter we are interested in. We need some information on him. And you were the last person to see him. A drifter? Yes, here is his photo. Chen Wei is his name. Tell me where you met this man. The security agent took a large photo out of the file and placed it in front of her. She blinked in confusion when she looked at it. The man he referred to as Chen Wei in the photo was a man with brown hair and blue eyes, a thin face, and white skin. Chen looked nothing like that with his round, tanned face, flat features, and black hair. How could they think it was Chen? Or was Chen even who he said he was? I don't think I understand, Kamori answered. The security guard looked very displeased. Don't try to hide it, Miss Ando. We know everything that has happened. You had contact with this man, and we need to know what he told you. Where did you meet him? Why is he under investigation? Kimori asked suddenly, feeling a warmth under her fingertips through the bag. Lucky Cat shifted almost imperceptibly. She surely must be listening. I don't think you understand the serious nature of the trouble you are in, Miss Sando, the security guard replied. This is no small matter, and when you and you will be charged with a crime if you aren't forthcoming with the details. We have reason to believe that you committed a string of murders, and you will be seen as an accessory because of your involvement with him. Where did you meet this man? I went out walking one evening, and there was a man sitting on the patio I hadn't seen before. When I questioned him about what he was doing there, he told me he was lost, so I sent him to the banana club with some money. Kimori's mind fought against the man's accusations. Chen, a murderer? That didn't seem right. Not that this, this was even the man who stayed with her. Chen spent nearly a week with her and was nothing but chivalrous and kind. He never laid a finger on her. He could have killed her in her sleep, or robbed her, or worse. But he was always cheerful and concerned about her. But he had warned her repeatedly that she could be in trouble if he stayed with her. Why didn't she take his concern seriously? All of the possibilities seemed very far away and unbelievable, even after Belinda's disappearance. She was too impressed with him and wanted him to stay. The Banana Club. We had word that it was being turned into a covert gambling den. Do you frequent that club at all, Miss Ando? Tell us the truth, because we'll find out anyway. No, I've only gone to the Banana Club once about five years ago when I first moved into the neighborhood to have a few meals before I learned to cook for myself. It was the first time I had lived alone, and I just needed a little time to adjust. I haven't been back there since. And what can you tell me about Chen's activities other than going to the club? Did it give you any personal details? 
I think he said his family was from New Vienna, but I'm not sure. She hoped her lie wouldn't be discovered, but everything else seemed so ridiculous about this conversation, she figured it couldn't hurt. He said he lost his job recently and had applied for a new one, but that it wasn't going well. I felt sorry for him and helped him a little. That was it. That was it. The security guard looked at her with a penetrating gaze, and she knew she wasn't convincing him of anything. He replaced the photo in the file and stood up. Walking to the door, he opened it and whispered with someone a moment, then returned with a blonde-haired female guard. Fill out the sheet and then go with Ariana. Looking at the paper placed before her, Kimori saw it was the declaration she had to sign, because she was going to be detained overnight. It had her full statistics, Kimori Ando, age 30, her parents' names, Chika Hagiwara and Doryo Ando, and their address. No mention of any other family was on the form. Her apartment address was listed, as was the address of her job. There was a block where she had to list the contents of her bag, and she quickly did, adding for good measure that the velvet pouch in her hand in her bag held a tube of lipstick, hoping that Lucky Cat would be overlooked and unmolested. She needed to be near Kamori more than ever. Standing, Kamori handed Ariana the completed form with a trembling hand. Clutching her bag more closely to her, she followed Ariana to lockdown. In the next chapter, which is a few after this one, um, Kimori has been released from custody, which is not typical of the people that disappear. So she feels a little bit um, happy about that, but it's still, it, she doesn't understand what's happening. So she's trying to adjust to the situation back at her apartment. So chapter nine, a clue. Kimori woke with a start. She sat up in bed, listening to the darkness carefully, barely able to see the outline of, her, of the furniture in her bedroom. What was it that had awakened her? She strained to remember. Maybe it was something in a dream. Feeling restless, she turned on the light beside her bed and got up, sliding on her slippers and throwing on her robe. Not bothering to turn the light on in the kitchen, letting the dim light spilling from her bedroom illuminate the shadows, she took out a small plastic cup, pulled back the tab, added some hot water, and stirred it. The warm scent of coffee filled the room. Sitting down at the table to drink it, Kimori saw that Lucky Cat was watching her closely, puzzled. The little red cat was lying on her side. The shiny gold flower painted on her stomach turned toward Kimori. It will be many hours until morning, Lucky Cat said, glancing towards the window where the blinds shut out the light of the quarter moon. Why aren't you sleeping? You've had a hard few days and really should get your rest. Kimori sipped her coffee, listening to Lucky Cat's gentle scolding. She sighed. I don't have to go back to work for a few days, and I can't sleep, Kamori said. I need to find Chen. I didn't kill anyone, and I'm sure he didn't either. I liked having him around. He couldn't have done anything like that. And what was all that about that chair? How absurd. She drank more of her coffee, letting Lucky Cat take in her frantic outburst. So the key seems to be to find Chen, right? Lucky Cat said, rolling over onto her stomach and sitting on her haunches attentively before Kamori's cup. She peered over the edge and licked a drop of coffee off of the rim before continuing. The police said that they came here to, to the apartment to search it. Did you look around to see what may be out of place? Kimori looked at Lucky Cat for a moment, thinking. The chair clearly wasn't from this apartment, so did they actually search it? She asked softly. I wonder. But if they didn't, maybe you can see if Chen left anything behind. They wouldn't have noticed something like that if they were never, never here. Kimori felt like there was something wrong with Lucky Cat's logic somehow, but she was desperate for answers. There was no other way to clear up matters with the secret police but to find Chen and see what he knew, to see if there was any truth to this outrageous accusation. Lucky Cat was right. She hadn't really searched her apartment that carefully after he left since she had been so unhappy. Finishing her coffee when Lucky Cat put her paws out of the way, Kimori got up and went into the living room where Chen had stayed most of the time while he was with her. Turning on all of the lights in the room, uh, so the room was blazing in a yellowish glow, she started looking at the love seat and chairs. Without warning, she pulled out all of the cushions and felt all around the surface of the bottoms of all of the seats. She noticed a few stray black hairs, short like Chen's rather than uh, uh, her own long black hair, but nothing else seemed to be there. She replaced the pillows and wondered where to look next. Falling down on her knees, she looked under the chairs and love seat. Since it was rather dark to see what might have fallen underneath or been hidden there, she used her hand to fill the surface of the short piled carpeting. All she found were a few crumbs and dust. Sneezing a little, she stood up and looked around the room. 
She pulled the magazines off of the small tables near each chair, but she found nothing there either. What about the radio? Chen had spent a lot of time listening to it while she was at work from what it seemed. She went over to it and looked through all of the wooden compartments under it. As her hand slid into the one with the games, her fingers slid against a thin but dull edge of something like paper. Struggling to get a grip on it with her fingers, she carefully slid forward her prize and held it up to the light. It was a small black and white photo of Chen. On the back was a fading scrawled address written in blue ink. It was her district, not far from her apartment. Perhaps this was where he, he lived. Kumori stared at the photo, dazed a moment. It was the photo the police should have shown her, not Dimitri's. His expression was neutral, and he was wearing his thick-rimmed brown glasses. She couldn't help but notice again that he was rather attractive. Why would he have put the photo in her radio cupboard? Taking the photo in to Lucky Cat, who had tipped over her plastic coffee cup to lick out the last few drops, Kumori held it up for Lucky Cat to examine. I found something. His photo. Why would he leave something like that behind? Could the police have planted it? Lucky Cat looked at the photo a moment at her, as her mouth spread into a toothy cat grin. It's a start, Lucky Cat said. I don't know who left it there. I was with you the whole time, remember? Maybe I should have left you home with Chen, Kimori muttered to herself, looking back at the photo, uh, at the back of the photo again, thinking, I should go here. It, that seems like the most obvious step to take next. I must find him again. Kimori left the photo on the table in front of Lucky Cat and ran back to her room to throw on her skirt and blouse. Wait, what are you going to do? Lucky Cat said, her thin voice sounding faint in Kimori's room. You aren't planning of going on out now to find him, uh, are you? It's in the middle of the night. The secret police will find that rather suspicious, don't you think? You should wait to go investigate in the morning. I'm not waiting, Kimori said as she flipped off the light in her bedroom and ran into the kitchen to put on her shoes and grab her coat. Are you coming with me? Get in your velvet sack so you can come with me. I don't care how dangerous it is. I need to see Chen, and this is the only clue I have to find him. Well, it's better I go with you so you don't get into too much trouble. Lucky Cat smuggled into her pouch, and Kumori threw it into her purse, grabbed her keys, and went out the front door. Okay, the last section I'm going to read for part two is the next chapter, chapter 10, Night Walk. Since it was so late at night, the streets were deserted, though Kumori thought she saw some shadowy figures in a few of the alleys she passed. The streetlights were on dim since no one was really out, and the dark clouds that flitted across the quarter moon and blocked it out also brought a haziness to the glowing lamps. There were very few of the buses that served the city's main, as, as the city's main transport this late, too. Clutching her coat and bag close to her, though the evening was unseasonably warm after the snow flurries the day before, Kumori quickened her, her pace, squinting to read the street signs as she passed them. The address on Chen's photo shouldn't be far, she thought, though she couldn't believe that they were practically neighbors. He hadn't given her that impression when they had spoken. She thought she knew the place, just at the edge of the apartment zone in a more depressed area, a neighborhood with a cluster of small shops, warehouses, and a few clubs that were all shuttered. Kumori slowed her pace as she neared the address that she was looking for. Just beyond the last shop, Kumori found the place she sought, a darkened warehouse with stained windows and a chain across the door. Stepping up to one of the windows, she pressed her face near the glass to try to see in but it was too dark to tell what was inside. She tried the chain across the door, but it held fast. Noticing an alley that bordered the far side of the, the fairly large building, she glanced back over her shoulder. The street was empty, and she quietly approached the alley and looked down it. Don't, she heard the muffled voice of Lucky Cat say. Shh, we can't go back now. I have to know. Hesitantly, she walked down the alley. It was almost too dark to see, so she let her fingers brush the side of the building lightly as she walked. About halfway down the alley, she touched a door. Maybe we can get in this way, she whispered to Lucky Cat. Running her hand down the door, her fingers bumped into the doorknob. The door, seemed, uh, the door opened soundlessly when she turned it, and the interior seemed a little brighter. A light was on somewhere down the hall inside, which could not be seen from the front of the building. Closing the door quietly behind her, she walked toward the light, on her guard as to what she might find. Once she had got close enough, she peeked around the corner into the room. A man with short black hair was standing in the middle of the room with his, with his back to her, a high-powered flashlight in his hand. He was studying something written on the wall, but in the glare it was hard to read what it said. It also put most of his figure at the center of a dark shadow. 
but she felt certain of who it was. There you are, she said softly, hoping for him to turn around and be pleased to see her. The man jumped as if startled, and the flashlight wavered in his hand. As he turned, the flashlight's beam hit his face, and Kimori realized that she had made a mistake. She was stun stunned to see who was standing before her. Samori, what are you doing here? she asked with a gasp. Kimori, I should ask you the same, he said sternly, walking toward her, blocking her view of the wall behind him. Only then did she notice he was wearing a sharp-looking gray suit with a blue silk tie. It was her brother, but since when did he ever start dressing like this? She couldn't remember ever seeing him this way. What are you doing here? he asked with an air of such authority that she dared not avoid answering him. I was looking for a friend, she said weakly, still staring at him in amazement. In the middle of the night. I find that highly unlikely. But you're here now, too. I'm here because of, it's my job to be here. I'm on an official investigation. This district is no place for a lady. You need to go home now. Zamori reached his free hand out and pushed her a little roughly back down the hallway toward the door. But wait, how did you get permission to come to the city? Why didn't you contact me when you came? I would have loved to have spent time with you had I known. How are Mom and Dad? I wonder if it's a good idea to leave them alone in the countryside. As she was chattering on, she was aware he was looking at her with barely concealed irritation. It had been five years since they had seen one another, but he had changed so much. When she had left him, he seemed to be just the gentle, lanky boy who liked to wear corduroys and work shirts when helping her mother in the family garden. Coming to New Caledonia had transformed him into something else altogether. I got permission to come to work in New Caledonia four years ago, Kamori. I didn't contact you because it wasn't any use to. I'm assigned to live in the northern quarter of the city. Why would I want to come here to the restricted area where you live? So they gave you a high-level government job then. I know I'm just an office worker, but you still should have notified me. I could have asked for permission to come see you in the northern quarter. It has been difficult for me to adjust to the city, to city living these past five years, and it would have been nice to know I wasn't here alone. Samori didn't answer. What's on the wall there that you were looking at? He looked back over his shoulder toward the wall as if remembering why he was there. I'm investigating a report that his warehouse was a hideout for an outlaw group. There was supposedly some illegal activity here. The graffiti was a clue. He swept the flashlight past it quickly, too fast for her to read what it said. The light moved to another corner where the wall seemed to have been slashed apart with something sharp. Looking around at the room, Kamori realized it was quite a sinister place. What did it have to do with Chen? It's dangerous to be here. Did you say you just came here looking for a friend? Your friend must be rather unsavory if that's the case. Kamori's mind raced to think of a good answer. I was detained by the secret police yesterday. They showed me a photo of a man connected with my case and some physical evidence I didn't understand. I thought I might learn more about the situation if I came here. The secret police, he said with some amusement. Yes, that's who I've been working for since I came to New Caledonia. What was the man's name? Kamori hesitated, but she realized that Sumori could go to the police and find out anyway. His reaction made her feel a little afraid. They were so close before, but there was no evidence of that bond now. Chen Wei. Ah, that man. I see. Sumori smiled as his voice turned even more scornful. Chen Wei is a drifter pretending to be some important underground leader, a charlatan journalist who considers himself independent from officialdom. He's been denied housing and a job because of his political activity. You need to stay away from him, Kamori. Did I say I ever met him? I just said it was someone the police mentioned. Kamori hoped her voice sound sounded nonchalant. Samori nodded. Do you have any friends in town? Any boyfriend? I had a friend for a while, but she's no longer working at my office. An understatement, Kamori thought. She had a sudden idea. As for boyfriends, I met someone who might be a candidate. Do you know Dim Dimitri Solovia? The effect of the name on Samori was intense, but Kamori couldn't put her finger on what it meant. How did you meet him? Samori's voice didn't betray a trace of a concern or interest. He was just a guy I met in my neighborhood at the Banana Club a few times. It's nothing serious. Suddenly they heard a booming outside. Kamori nearly jumped in terror. The storm is finally rolling in, Samori said calmly, taking a pen and notepad out of his jacket as he let the flashlight bob wildly and throw shadows over the delicate features of his face. He wrote something quickly on a slip of paper and handed it to her, steadying the light again. Take this and come uh, see me in a few days. I'll see if I can clear up your problem with the secret police in the meantime. Go home now before the rain starts and stay away from this place from now on. 
Kamori took the slip of paper from his hand and glanced at it. The paper had an address on it. She stuffed it in her bag, careful not to let Tsumori see the contents. It was good to see you, she said, biting her lip and turning to go, wondering if she really meant what she said. Her last glimpse of Tsumori before she began to walk back down the hallway to the alley door was merely of his disinterested expression. He didn't say another word as she shut the door behind her. It was as if they were now strangers.